Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Vanguard. We got a super special guest for you guys, a really great live stream. Super excited for today's conversation. How you doing, Zach? Yeah, dude, ready to get funky with the funky academic. Uh, but before we do, I always like to begin our uh, episodes with a quick shout out to the Patreon uh, community. Uh, shout out to you guys uh, for helping us keep the show afloat, keep it going, keeping uh, us coming to you guys uh, really routinely like we're able to. We really appreciate it. It means a lot to us. Yeah, huge shout out to the patron community. You guys know the drill. We do like to start and end our live streams with a huge shout out to our patron community. So just a big thank you to everyone that's supporting the show. The link is in the description if you would like to join our patron community and get access to some of the benefits we offer, like our exclusive Discord server, early uh, access to certain episodes, and our monthly patron hangout, which is going to be coming up in just the next week or so. So yeah, just a huge shout out to our patrons. And again, if you would like a spot on the screen yourself, then hit up that link. It's in the description. It's patreon.com slash the Vanguard channel. But that's not why you guys are here. You're here to see us chat with the funky academic himself. We're super excited to welcome him to the stream. How you doing, Rami? Hey, thanks for having me. It's gonna be of fun. course. Thanks for uh, coming on. We're excited to chat with you. Let's do it. Um, so I guess um, one of the things that I, I wanted to kind of get the ball rolling with in our uh, conversation with is I noticed uh, the other day when I was uh, watching some of your videos and doing some you know, research on your channel that your YouTube channel has been around for quite a while. I think I, I saw that it was uh, launched first in uh, 2011. And I'm wondering if I could just get a quick origin story of the uh, funky academic uh, you know, how did you come to start making videos on YouTube? And, and what was your initial like catalyst to get out there and, uh, you know, share your voice with people? Well, the first time I did a video, a real video of this iteration was probably around 2014 when I just started doing little videos on academic philosophy, because I think people are bad about talking about ideas. But, you know, when you're bad about talking about ideas and other people are better at it, then when people kind of get confused and need an idea to help think through their problem they're going to reach for the idea that's around so the idea so my idea was that like if we get people better about talking about meaning and ideas that way when they get confused and have to make big decisions they'll actually have the resources in order to uh, make these bigger decisions about their lives so I wanted to I wanted to improve the quality of academic philosophy and I started with a few like short videos just talking about what is justice, what is neoliberalism, what are institutions, stuff like that, in order to kind of get people thinking about these ideas. Because like I said, if you don't have kind of a resource internally to think through these big issues, other people make a lot of money by putting those ideas that aren't in your interests in your mind. So I wanted to give people like intellectual resources to think through these issues on their own. Well, thanks so much for joining us again. And yeah, I love your channel, love your content. Uh, one of the most articulate and interesting thinkers, not afraid to deviate from the mainstream um, thought. Really appreciate that about your um, content and commentary. So again, thank you so much for joining us today on The Vanguard. Uh, we're so okay. pleased to meet you and, and share this dialogue. Um, it does look like we already have a super chat. And this is something that I was planning on asking already. So it's perfect. Brian's wondering uh, about your take on inflation. And again, this is perfect because I actually have this tweet pulled up that I wanted to respond to or get your response to uh well it's your tweet so you can just you know explain your thought process but um you said i'm a bit baffled by why the biden administration isn't beating the drum on why they think there is inflation and the plan to boost productivity and bring prices down uh do you think he thinks that people haven't noticed and and that's exactly how i'm feeling uh, it, it seems crazy the kind of non-response we're seeing the lack of um, assured, assuredness from this administration as far as this issue goes. And it's obviously something that's affecting, you know, middle class families and lower class people the most out of, out of anyone. So, um, yeah, what's your take on inflation right now? All right. So this idea that it's not a political issue or that Biden's like non-response is an appropriate political response is not immoral, impolitical. It's just irresponsible because, you know, more than people care about their vote, they actually interact with the world through the prices they pay for goods in civil society. So like they've noticed, they've noticed that there is a problem that their dollar doesn't reach as far. And it's not just on certain goods. It's kind of leaked into food. So Biden has to help people like his job is to help people think through the public policy problems in their life. So like we know that about 60%, we don't know, but we're pretty sure about 60% of the inflated prices are just corporate corporations using it, like the idea of inflation to jack up prices because now they have a, a, a reason to do it, right? So capitalism is going to capitalize. And so that's not really, I don't actually blame the individual CEOs for doing that because they're, they're beholden to shareholder profit. So if someone's giving you an excuse 
to jack up prices and then you use that excuse to jack up prices, you can't really expect them to not behave that way. Um, but what you can do is use that as an argument for now we need to start talking about price controls, right? Maybe we need to start talking about price controls for certain goods and uh, because the, the, the market's not going to have the competitive atmosphere to keep prices down. Also, a lot of this is about the supply chain issues, right? So we need to actually invest in production. I'm in Athens, Georgia right now, and I can say this pretty generally for the entire South. We have good weather, but we're underproducing because of one, racism, and two, like in, uh, material and cultural infrastructure. So if you actually invest in the material and cultural infrastructure in Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, we could boost up productivity, and productivity will boost up competition, drive prices down. But you have to have the conversation about how this isn't about Inflation's not about like um, child tax credit or like uh, the the, uh, the stimulus check. Volume. Yeah, the stimulus check. No, inflation's about like we're just under we don't we have a, we don't have the productive infrastructure to in order to make productivity enhancing assets that will allow people to produce and bring prices down. So if we have more people who are better able to produce and you know the infrastructure for some of these middle and larger um industries that can't just happen with a regular cultural infrastructure uh, material and cultural infrastructure but if we provide like an actual business and production infrastructure domestically here we can get rid of some of the uh, supply chain issues and bring comp and bring prices down through competition this is how and that's like a pretty like market friendly approach <laughs> to um how we address inflation and I'd, I'd like to see biden talking about this in this way talking about what it would take to boost productivity and what we would need to invest in our productivity enhancing assets to allow us to solve our supply chain issues and allow like more goods to be at market and on the market to bring the con to bring the prices down instead what we get is the conversation about like how poor people are having too much money now. <laughs> and that's, I think that's ridiculous. And instead of like figuring out how do we make everyone more productive? Like how can we like secure the infrastructure, productivity infrastructure to allow people to produce goods and get their goods to market that'll bring uh, prices down in the appropriate way. And then we need to start talking about for other industries, how do we allow for payroll subsidies? Um, so that, you know, the excuse that companies have to uh, raise prices in order to pay their workers goes away, just, just goes away. It might not actually be true, and, but it would just go away if we actually have sector specific payroll subsidies. And this is all something we can do as like a nation if we thought in these terms. And this is why I'm frustrated with, with both the progressives in the Congress and the executive and not for not thinking about these terms because look pretty much you have to understand how we think about food and food production and the fda and the and, and the uh and the the farming industry kind of emerged with in agriculture subsidies like everything we know about pricing of food right now is an artifact of the new deal yeah right? i mean yeah you preach into the choir you got two guys in uh from kansas over here so yeah. oh yeah yeah, so like everything we know about agriculture is an artifact from the, the New Deal. So there we just decided the best way to subsidize agriculture is to subsidize the farmers, the owners. Now we could subsidize agriculture by just saying like, look, all right, we need our strawberries. We want the strawberries cheap. We need to subsidize strawberry pickers so that the farmers still pay $6 an hour, but the pickers get $25 an hour because $15 of that is subsidized by the government. So you can have payroll subsidies, which will keep the price of the goods down, make sure that the laborers get paid and uh, everyone wins. And so it's not, it's, it's, and we did that for the farmers. Um, we just need to start thinking about it, doing it for the workers. And we can, we just need to open up our ideas. So that's I what I think about inflation. Yeah, I was having this exact conversation uh, about two days ago uh, with a coworker of mine, and you know, he was talking. We were actually talking about rent prices, but it kind of segued into meatpacking prices and how you know inflation inf infects basically every aspect of the market. Uh, and you know, I was he, you know, he was talking about like 
you know, yeah, this is, you know, just kind of like the way it is, man. Like, you know, fucking sucks. Right. And I was like, no, this is not the way it has to be. Like, we've already solved this problem before in the, you know, with the, the New Deal and FDR. And that's why, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, milk prices always stay low. Like wheat prices always stay low. Corn prices always stay low. That's why we use corn in everything, uh, because they made sure that nobody was going to starve to death after uh, the Great Depression by subsidizing, you know, basic goods. Uh, so uh, 100 percent agree with that, that, that argument that you're presenting. And one more thing. Uh, before I pass the baton off, uh, you mentioned that we don't even know if raising wages uh, will actually lead to an increase in the cost of consumer goods. And if you imagine or you take example from probably one of the most capitalist consumer heavy uh, corporations, mega conglomerates in the world, McDonald's, right? Uh, they have McDonald's in Copenhagen, Denmark, right? Where they have to give everybody like the equivalent of $25 yeah. an hour. They have to give everybody six weeks paid vacation. They have to, and, and guess how much a Big Mac is there? It's like 70 cents USD more expensive than it is yeah. in, in America. It's like, I don't know about you guys, but if I was making $25 an hour, I could afford an extra 70 cents on my Big Mac. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the stability that would that would bring. So the story we talk about who pays for what and how the prices get moved uh, is just a story. And you know the you know the CEOs of the companies are going to uh, tell us one story that might just not be true. It's just not true. Um, yeah, that's totally fair. And yeah, I think you're right on as far as inflation goes. Um, absolutely. Uh, another tweet that I that I wanted to get your. Uh, explanation on or discuss a little bit is this one about Bernie Sanders. And, and we've been talking a little bit lately about Bernie, you know, where he went awry in 2020, um, how he should have been more, uh, what's the word, more aggressive against Joe Biden and, and calling out his corruption, calling out the fact that he basically was the personification of the, you know, continuation of the Obama sort of neoliberalism, which, you know, Bernie was originally running against in the first place. It was, it was really bizarre. Anyway, um, you tweeted the other day something that I thought was interesting. And again, I wanted to get your full thoughts on. I'll pull it up right now. Uh, you said, the Bernie left, we are going to half-ass anti-black racial justice, only think about it when it happens to be convenient for our in our other ends, and then complain when black people take out our candidate in two years. Then you follow it up and say, um, Bernie was too weak to go for Biden's jugular. You think we trusted him to really do right by us when the white Dems were always going to be part of the problem? And then you say, for the record, I think Bernie lost ground between 2016 and 2020 by listening to feminists. So uh, if you could just kind of explain your uh, thought process behind these tweets and, and what exactly you meant by uh, him losing ground by listening to feminists, like which particular school of feminist thought are you talking about? Or uh, just what exactly did you mean by that? Uh, so the first thing is, I, it, it's controversial to say that he lost ground between 2016 and 2020, but I think he did. I think he did. I don't think he was... I. I, I yeah, I, I think he lost ground between 2016 and 2020 because he wasn't more clear about the most important issues. He wasn't more, people didn't have more faith in him about the more important issues in 2016 than they had in 2020, right? So um, black people in the South know that white Democrats and white Republicans are going to be the problem if you're serious. You can talk about universal solutions, that, about this like, you know, working class, solidarity across multiracial working class solidarity but black people in the south know that poor white people in the south are just like poorer versions of wealthy white people in the south so this idea that this idea that somehow you give poor white people in the south money as on the condition that they share power political and social power with black people, that they'll take the money and give up the privilege, I think is just, is naive, right? So it's naive to, to understand, like it's just naive about the dynamics of race in the South. People pay, white people pay for whiteness. That's why they want the money. They want the money to go to the segregated school. They want the money to move out of the hood. They want the money to buy distance from black people. And that's all that's generally the case in America writ large, which is why the the middle class identity is kind of distinguished, is uh I think the best characteristic for the middle class identity is distance from the black people you want to be distanced from. And that's as old as the New Deal, which only actually like, you know, with the uh, the the 
uh, GI Bill and the FHA only subsidized loans on the condition that they would be away from black communities, right? So racially, like when we created the middle class, we created it racialized. And so we have to understand that if you're going to actually, like the middle class identity is not a multicultural one. The middle class identity is anti-black. And so this idea that we can move everyone into the middle class without actually dealing with the racial like um, commitments of what that means, means you're just not, you don't know enough about how racism works in America. And black people in the South know that. So, so when Bernie says that like we can have a multiracial working class coalition and on the basis of this multiracial working class coalition, I'm not going to have to deal with the whites as whites. Black people don't believe it's true. They'll be like, that's nice, but that just means that you'll do what FDR did. And when the racist whites want to compromise the legislation, when it comes down to black, black, brass tax and the compromise is always going to be in the black community, you'll go along with it and then be like, well, we had to do it. Right? So black people know that. So black people know that. So the question is, are we going to go with an effective racist like Joe Biden, who's going to give us exactly what we think he's going to give. He's going to give us Clinton 2.0. Oh, we're going to give with a myopic racist and dealing with not myopic racist. Bernie's not a myopic racist, but a myopic like race guy um, who's not honest of, or doesn't know enough about like the social and political dynamics of black life in the South, where most of black people live, to, and who's going to end up selling us out by mistake. Right. So we all saw this year the progressives in Congress and even Bernie himself get rolled. If you're surprised that the progressive this year, the progressives this year and Bernie himself got rolled, you're not black. <laughs> because like, you know, like he got rolled. And it's not he was always the guy who was going to get rolled. And he never actually showed himself to be the guy who wasn't going to get rolled. And except this time, he took down as collateral damage the entire progressive movement. It would have just been black people had he been elected. And that's what black people are worried about. I think there could have been a way around it. But you have to understand the lack of cynicism um, among the white left about the working class, other white left, especially in the South, is 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 um, not really doesn't really give black people faith. So, right? oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just if I could uh, interject for one moment and ask a, a follow up question, you know, what would be some of, you know, so, say you, you have Bernie Sanders ear when he's running in, in 2016. Right. And it's the first crack of the ball. And, you, you know, and I think we all collectively agreed that, you know, as you said, he lost ground in, in 20, between 2016 and 2020. Uh, he wasn't as potent. I don't think it wasn't. Uh, but, you know, uh, that being said, I still, you know, cards on the table was a vocal yeah. supporter of Bernie Sanders during yeah. the, the 2020 election. But I, I'm really cu uh, curious to know uh how do you think those uh, problems could be avoided? Um, you know, what would be the kind of uh, coaching or, or policy advice that you or, you know, strategic advice, whatever you want to call it, campaign advice that you'd be giving to Bernie Sanders to, you know, uh, keep him from falling into these tra uh, traps? Right. Because, um, you know, uh, you're you, you know, you're articulating, you know, a, a critique that I th uh, obviously think is valid of the rising tides lift all boats kind of analogy. And that's one that, you know, I heard people who were skeptical of Bernie articulate multiple times throughout the uh, primary. But I'm wondering uh, in, in the American system of electoral politics, what would he what should he have done better? Uh, do you think? And what were some of the biggest mistakes that he made in that arena uh, from your perspective? And also, well, if you could explain the feminist thing, I'm still interested in, in how yeah, exactly yeah. You think him listening to feminists tanked him his campaign. We could go. Uh, we could go. I, I think he didn't lean hard enough on jobs. Right? I didn't think he leaned hard enough on labor and jobs. And you'll say that, well, he kind of ran on a federal job guarantee. Yes, he kind of did. But he didn't talk about it too much. He talked a lot about climate and not so much about jobs. And I think you need to talk about if you're going to be the candidate for the working class, you need to talk about jobs first. And you should have led every every campaign event with we're guaranteeing everyone who wants a job a unionized job at twenty dollars an hour at the time it's 15 i think it should have been 25 but anybody who wants a job are you willing to work we have work to do we'll find a job for you twenty dollars an hour number one 
And number two, that job is going to be doing doing uh, and it's going to be unionized. And that will just be the, the working condition floor in America. And I and and yes, that job is going to be doing climate change and restructuring our economy to make it sustainable. But you have to lead with work. You lead with work. And he never did that. And I think it's because too many Democrats are allergic to jobs. And, you know, I'm going to get in trouble for this. But like, by the way, the people who watch this, this is irony saying this. This isn't over, like, you know, I'm not saying anything about the vanguard and the, and the two, um, you know, very good working people who are doing right now. But we have to understand that there's a gender in we've gendered work in a way that's not not honest right and so like the prominent feminists are not working class women the prominent feminists are people who are fighting for the right and it's always been the same class who's been who's fighting for the right for the professional class job for women which is great which is great. I think there should be professional class women as many professional class women as men but to pretend that Hillary Clinton's feminist cred was uh, built on her fighting for like working class nannies to get paid a fair share. And that was her concern because um, they don't wear pantsuits to work. Right. So like the idea that there isn't a fundamental difference between our gendered division of work and labor and risk um, for women and men in the United States is, is, is kind of it's baffling. So you had a feminist Bernie that talked less about jobs. You had a feminist Bernie that talked less about jobs and a feminist Bernie that talked less about jobs because the primary, we've gendered jobs. Like, look, if you're a 20 year old guy going into the labor market, uh, you're going into college, you're going, you're a professional, you're a 20 year old guy um, thinking about uh, you're in college thinking about what to major in and what I should go into the labor market in. You're thinking about f the possibility that you're going to have to not only take care of you, you're going to have to also take care of your whole family because of the culture. It's possible that you are going to have to not only support yourself, but you're going to support the entire family. And that's how you think about the importance of job. And you don't expect ever to have the option of marrying into somebody who's going to work for you. If you're a 20 year old woman, that guy's sister in the same position is not under the same sort of responsibility. And we're not honest about that. They don't think, well, I need to think about the job as something I'm definitely going to have to have. Not an option. It's not about, well, should I work or should I not? I'm going to have to have a job and I should probably think for the eventuality that I might have to support my entire family, right? So that's just a, a cultural understanding. It's not the way it should be, it's not the way it ought to be, but it is the way that the gender scripts have emerged such that gender ideology is kind of a class ideology. To be a woman is to have a work optional life in the way that to be a man isn't. And so it's not like you're damned to working. It's like I should be, I should have the ability to work the job I choose, not like I'm going to have to work. Because when you're a guy, you're grown, you grow up, you know, you're going to have to work. If you're a professional, if you're like of a class of woman, you're not, and you aspire to be, to live into the gender ideology. If you're progressive, you're aspiring for the opportunity to work. And if you're conservative, you're aspiring for the opportunity to stay home and have someone else work. That's a different ideology. So, and let's, so if you take too many of these work optional people into your life, they will distort your notion and your campaign. It'll distort the centrality of jobs for your mission. You'll start talking about pronouns and shit. Like, <laughs> like jobs, and as soon as jobs start becoming other than central in your life or in your conception of like the political problems, then you've lost your way. I, I think you've lost your way. And I, I do think that, and you know, there are historical reasons. I can give you the, you know, the history of gender identity through colonialism and mm -hmm. all of that. Stuff. But there are historical reasons why like 
we've gendered just the conception of what work means in a way that like, yeah. people who take feminism seriously just won't take jobs as seriously. Interesting. In well, same way. I, I just want to <clears throat> ask you to clarify something. It, uh, because your answer on that, I, I understand what you're saying about how Bernie may have leaned too much into the, you know, wokeisms and, and too much of the identity politics sort of uh, lefty That's language. Feminism, yeah. um, and and you say that applies for feminism. But earlier you were saying he should have maybe spoken differently about racial politics and the way he addressed yeah. black voters. Uh, so so do you think he should have leaned more into the identity politics, so to speak, when it comes to race stuff, but less when it comes to gender stuff? Is that is that what you're saying? Well, the race stuff is tied to the job stuff in the way that the gender stuff isn't, right? So I think you could have gone from job, you could have pivoted from jobs to race, especially in terms of contracting and uh, setting up pipelines in a way that like, you know, we're trying to create more professional class, black HVAC repair people and roofers and who get those contracts. Not going to be a great feminist argument you say that to a room full of, you know, you know, resistance white women, they'll be like, okay, I guess I want my daughter to be a roofer too, but it's not going to be the same. But um, so you could have pivoted from jobs to like equality and racial politics in an easier way. But for the most part, black people need to see that he was willing to take on, fight and beat white people. Uh, for on uh, like take on, fight and beat white people for the sake of black people. It was a hard ask. Had he shown himself willing to do that, it would have been, I think, I, I think that would have been enough. But he wasn't ever, he never showed himself willing to do that. And the time he was willing to do it, he wasn't quite successful. Like in the time that like he almost went for Hillary Clinton in a serious way, he backed off. And as soon as you find a white guy who backs off that way, it's like, I don't want to put my lot into him because I know the next time he backs off, it's going to be, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to stick my neck out for someone who's going to back off in a pinch. Um, uh, because anybody who's not serious about ticking off other white people isn't ever really going to be serious about the quality of racial politics we need. Just like when you saw that the squad, especially uh, AOC, wasn't really serious about getting into Nancy Pelosi's face and eating her lunch, you realize that, oh, she's not actually going to be the one we need. Um, so Yeah, like, I understand what you're saying here, I mean, The only issue I have or hang up is that couldn't you make the same argument about uh, gender and about feminism? You know, if he needed to be more serious about bucking the patriarchy versus bucking the, the white people, like, the, isn't it kind of the same uh, conclusion at the end of the day, just two different schools of of thought yeah i don't think white women have it that bad yeah i don't i don't think that one i don't think white women have it that bad two i don't think they're honest about the perks if we actually got serious about getting rid of of all like dalliances professional dalliances in the workplace and all like if we if we actually took sexual harassment seriously and sexual like conduct seriously in all aspects of civil society except like these prescribed aspects that are determined for like mating then the biggest uh i suspect the biggest uh lobbyist against that would be other white women who want the option to marry well <laughs> so so you start like everyone's a feminist till they want a mouse killed and but, then, like, and well, so, like, well, hold I on don't, for, yeah, what's up? Oh, well, hold on, man, because uh, that, that that's a very, like, I feel like there's, that's a, a more narrow interpretation, uh, like, that's a very, like, uh, white feminist reading of, of feminism, right? What would you, um, okay. what would your thoughts have been, you know, if Bernie Sanders had, you know, embraced a more, you know, um, God, what's the fucking term for it? Intersectional. Uh, intersectional right? feminism. Yeah, sorry. All right, so um, all these alt feminisms are mm -hmm. just that. They're managed uh, um, uh, oppositions for what is like, you know, our fundamental gender identity. We have a problem with gender in this country. That's manhood. It's also womanhood, right? There are entitlements that go to manhood that need to be abolished. There are entitlements that go to womanhood that need to be abolished. We only talk about one side and we don't talk about the division of risk that we've gendered 
for the benefit of women. The only people who do talk about this are like kind of conservative women who are often who are awful in other ways, but they are honest about women. We don't want to be drafted for wars. We don't want to actually, we want to be able to call the cops. We don't want to be expected to be cops. So, um, and then when I talk to students about this, I say like, all right, so I have my students raise their hand. Who went to prom? And then everyone raises their, like a, a lot of students raise their hand. And then it's like, all right, so who asked out their prom dates? The guys raised their hand out. Who was asked out? The women raised their, who, uh, women raised their hand up. Then I was like, well, who would give up the right to be asked out? If Who likes that they weren't expected to ask out of the women? And then the women would keep their hand, hand up. And I was like, who expects to propose to marriage? And then the guys raised their hand. Who expects to be proposed to? The women raised their hand. Where, of these women, who actually wants the responsibility of proposing? And then the women were like, oh, I don't want that because I could get turned down. So like there are perks in the division of risk in society that are gendered in a way that's like actually pretty good for women. And we're not talking about it. So the alt feminists, the problem is womanhood in the same way that the problem is manhood. And so the alt feminists who say that like, well, you know, there's a different uh, structure in, you know, in racialized communities. And there's a different form of oppression. And that's true to the extent that when I asked who asked whom out, um, uh, the, the black women in the class, like in the white and the, the black men, those were more, there was more egalitarian. So like in, in out, and there's literature to support this, a book called Jim Sudanus's uh, Social Dominance, and uh, yeah, it came out in 89, but it, you know, it, it goes into the, the, the details about the studies and the division of risk in society. And it turns out that racialized men, outgroup men, whether you're talking about Jews in Nazi Germany, black people in the US, or you know, Palestinians, uh, lower caste men, this is a big deal in India because lower caste communities in, in India, it turns out they are more gender egalitarian they are because gender is primarily a class marker, right? So the more you're concerned with gender, the more you say that gender first, is the more it's a, it's a kind of a class aspiration, unless you actually want like woman roofers, women who, and women in police officers, not calling the police, police officers, right? right? So like, like the feminist concerns where women have it bad, it's not necessarily bad. And it's also gendered because at the bottom rung, there's egalitarian and the like it's it's egalitarian, more egalitarian in the household. And now real quickly, what this comes up, and I talked to the students about this and they didn't know it came up, was in driving. And so it turns out white guys like to drive in relationships. I didn't really take it seriously, but it, tur it turns out, I don't know, you could do your own little qualitative studies that in relationships among the whites, um, guys drive. And I didn't know that's the case because like, you know, my mom always drove when I grew up and like in my relationships, it's like, I remember the first time I was at a date, I was, I was, I was dating someone and she, and she was white and she threw me the keys to her car. And I was like, why would I drive your car? That's ridiculous. But apparently it's a whole thing that even if the girl owns the car, the guy will drive it because guys are supposed to drive. You know, the whites have some strange gender like that. That didn't make any sense to me, like at all. But apparently it's a whole thing that's like normalized among the whites about like guys drive because I guess lady brains aren't good enough to like. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah no i see what i see the point you're making and uh, i did get a super chat too that i wanted to get your response to um alex is wondering uh you know he says chris hedges says that anytime a politician joins either the democratic or republican party they are compromised if you agree with hedges then shouldn't black voters never vote for either party uh so yeah what's your thoughts on that and at large do you think that reforming the democratic party strategy is the way to go or are you on board with someone trying to challenge biden uh through the democratic party channels or at this point are you completely given up on the duopoly in, in either party i don't know if you get the me i don't know if you get the media attention if you go through a different party i just don't know if there's a media infrastructure that that happens through a third party i guess i'm open to hear third party challenges but um I I I I think we have two games in town and yeah you either go through the Democratic Party or the Republican Party but you can raise the like that's the only way you get the platform to actually raise the issues and if you can raise the issues in a way that catches fire 
more the better. For example, I'm not sure that Andrew Yang isn't a Republican. And like in in like some like he could just as easily oh, go is, that bro. way too. <laughs> and it's like where in the same way that Donald Trump could have ran as Democrat. Like, right. So like it's it's where do you think you can get the platform to actually articulate your powerful independent ideas? Is there and anyone I, right now that you have your eye on that you're hoping steps up to the plate and, and takes on that task? I liked Rashida Tlaib. I've always been, she was always my favorite member of the squad. Um, I, I, I like Rashida Tlaib. And if there's anyone who comes outside and acts as a challenger, I think she's got the chops. She's was she strong. born in America? Was she? Okay, she was. Yeah, so she could born, be eligible. Parents are Palestinian. Um, so she's got the chops. She has the experience. She she knows poli- she can play all the posi- I think she's I think she's the one that I would like on the debate stage with Biden. Um and going for it, or anyone, because who knows if Biden's going to uh, 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 rerun. But I like Rashida Tlaib. So she'd be the one. She's the only one I think, only one I can think of right now who I think has the chops, has the arguments, and um, could could actually like put the issues forward in, a, in, a, in an interesting way. People like Nina Turner. I mean, like, I, I guess. But like Rashida Tlaib, I think, is the one for me. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, what's your uh, kind of uh, analysis as far as, uh, you know, there's been this huge debate on the left, right? And, you know, is it a mutual aid versus electoralism, electoral, you know, you just kind of said there's two games in town. So uh, the Democratic Party is corrupt. Uh, and so is the Republican Party. So a lot of people have kind of thrown up their arms and said, I'm done donating my money to candidates. I'm done donating my money to this rigged game. Uh, Elections are just getting more and more expensive, which requires outsiders to fundraise even more and more off the backs of the working class with money that's just going to evaporate and never be seen again in their communities. So a lot of people are taking the position that, you know, a dollar spent on mutual aid is far better dollar than one spent on uh, politics. And I'm wondering what your, uh, you know, analysis of that situation is would you rather see people in your community reinvesting it in a mutual aid or would you rather see them you know get behind Rashida Tlaib if she were to announce for a 2024 challenge to uh, Joe Biden yeah so I don't I'm not a huge fan of mutual aid as a substitute for actually good governance because the the mutual aid organizations are just another form of nonprofits. And from Thomas Paine on, you just see that charity doesn't do the work of justice. It doesn't have the power to compel and it doesn't have the resources to actually, you know, move contracts. Right. So mutual aid is like, I think should be considered like mutual relief. I guess you can think about relief, pain relief, but it's not a serious problem any more than palliative care is a serious um, uh, solution to, uh, you know, an illness. Right. So palliative care is what they put people in right before they're going to die. It's not a serious solution to get rid of the illness. And the the mutual aid we need, I think, should be people supporting podcasts like this and and independent journalists like you guys. And even myself can go over to www.funkyacademic.com and kick in five, fifteen or fifty dollars a month. Um, because depending on who you talk to, talking like this makes me down white unemployable, you know. But um retweet. <laughs> but the uh, the mutual aid that, like the idea that somehow independent organizations that don't have the power to actually enforce their edicts and are still subject to like clan governance at the level of the state and sometimes the municipality, um, it, it's 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 kind of a it's it's a smoke show. And it's not different than the charity con that a lot of churches and do-gooders um, uh, and billionaires try to uh, proffer off as, as a substitute for good governance. And, the, you know, an ancillary comment to this is a lot of people say like, well, that means we need to make change at the local level. And look, a lot of these local charters are grants from the state. That means they'll own, you have more power at the local level, but power over what? You can't actually do anything without the state going at it, right? So you need, you need to control the culture. So if you're going to do local politics, the one, play, the one arena of politics that we should go to that we don't take seriously enough, that the right, unfortunately, like a lot of things they do take seriously, school boards. You control the mind, you control the behind. There needs to be a left like agenda in terms of taking over school boards and getting labor history um, 
in the schools. Like, do you guys even study the free farmers in Kansas about how, like, you nope. know, this is the yeah. So if you don't know the people who watch this from Kansas, the reason why the yeah, the people in Kansas joined the North it wasn't, wasn't any like some great like fan of the Negro. No, they didn't want to. The free farmers in Kansas didn't want to have to compete with the slave planters in uh, the South. They didn't want to have to compete with plantation labor. They wanted to be, ha have their goods in market at regular prices and not have to compete with plantation labor. And they were so serious about that because their entire livelihood like and dignity was tied to being a free farmer that they joined the North in, in fighting against slavery because they didn't want to have to compete with slave labor. Right. So like that's the kind of history that needs to be taught in schools so that people understand the tie between like labor, politics, militarism, and just so that you understand yourself. Right. So like the free farmers in Kansas wanted to like didn't want to compete against slave labor. And that should be taught in the, every person in Kansas as a part of their history. And that's what we need people on the school boards making sure that that is what's taught. And, and the teachers don't know. Teachers can't teach what the teachers don't know. And if the teachers don't know this, that means they're not going to teach it. And since a lot of teachers are white women who don't care about jobs in general, this is, this is what you're going to get, right? So you'll get taught like niceness and other things and so instead of like the hard scrabble, like history of what it meant like for Kansas to win freedom for its farmers. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. So you can, okay. Well, I was just going to cut in and, and mention on the mutual aid point. Um, what would be your opinion of a group like the Black Panthers, for example, that kind of, you know, framed their mutual aid as a, a self-defense to state sponsored violence? Like, do you think there's a, a place for that in, in today's society? Uh, so the, the one, a few good things about the, the Black Panthers mutual aid program is if there's a clip that I don't have with me, but I'll show with you guys at some other place about, um, uh, it wasn't clear. It was a different Black Panther walking through the health clinic they ran in Chicago. And it was a health clinic. So they they got volunteer nurses and a, a volunteer doctor to, to give. Um, and they were looking for a school bus and they wanted to like actually expand the programs. But it didn't happen because they didn't have secure, they, secure um, resources. And like a government, but it was a model for other government programs to actually institute with secure funding. So one of the reasons we have neighborhood health clinics was because of the model that was set forth by the Panthers. Now, you know, it, it was a good model insofar as it was taken up by other governments, but it wasn't exactly sufficient to even meet the need in Chicago. But it was good to model what could happen if the government does its job. Also, one interesting thing about the model that the Black Panther um, uh, Health Clinic set up was that you'd go in, you'd get checkup, you'd get a checkup, and then when you left, you would get matched with a community advocate because the idea is that you can't really be healthy and disempowered in your community at the same time. So like, yeah, we'll take your blood pressure and we'll, we'll, we'll make sure and we'll try to get some insulin for you. But yeah, we're going to also match you up with a community advocate to make sure that like, you know, you're not getting screwed on your heating bill and all of these other things that are causing health stresses in your life. So there's a kind of a holistic attitude in health that was pioneered uh, by the Panthers in their movement. So you get like with mutual aid, you kind of get like a little bit of play to, to think about these problems in different ways. Um, without actually, and, and so that's good, but it's, it'll only ever serve as a model to be taken up by a government that can do it seriously. Yeah, that's interesting. I know that, um, you know, and, and that's an interesting thing because, you know, harm reduction as a leftist, as somebody who has empathy for their community is something that you obviously want to sink your teeth into. You want to go and do those things, you know, yeah. uh, because w the alternative, it feels like you're just sitting on your hands, right? right. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, I'll, I'll use Kansas City as an example. Um, you know, a lot of hunger in Kansas City, a lot of unhoused folks in Kansas City, uh, you know, and, and, you know, there's a lot of constructive organizing, tenants, rights groups, stuff like that. People can advocate for themselves and do, uh, you know, better uh, uh, for themselves, you know, when they've had something to eat or a place to sleep and such. So I, I do find it hard to uh, difficult to balance that fact, you know, uh, you know, you don't want to ever like discourage people from trying to make their community a better place and uh, a, a more a less toxic place, right? Sure, that's, the, that's different. Palliative care is not the same as empowerment. Yeah, no, Pall that's yeah, yeah, that 
Yeah, that's a completely uh, fair point. I just wanted to qualify by saying, you know, uh, it, it does. It, I mean, it feels easy to get like uh, wrapped up in like this sort of like, it, it, you know, doom and gloom. Like, where do you go f in the future if every single all, uh, avenue is just like uh, a, a bad one? Like I was listening to our, uh, Brianna Joy Gray articulate this way better than I ever could. But she was talking about how as somebody who is a podcaster, uh, you know, who talks to people a lot, uh, you know, and you know how fucked up the world is and you ask people about all these different strategies and everybody tells you that none of these strategies will work. Uh, it creates this like kind of wheel spinning in the mud kind of energy for the left. And I'm wondering what you think we should do about that. Uh, so I'm not one of these guys who thinks none of the strategies will work. I actually think a real labor first strategy. Um, but first you have to uh, like would actually work, but you have to get comfortable talking about jobs and you have to get comfortable talking about the centrality of jobs for people's meaning in life and the, the idea that you can't be free in the United States without some sort of steady income and you can't be free in the United States without some sort of steady income from doing productive work from being a meaningful part of the society that you can if necessary leverage <laughs> like go on strike and it actually matters and like you get like you need to you need to actually meaningfully participate in society, not just be in a warm place and be fed, but actually have meaningful power and a place and standing in society for you. That's why I'm kind of I was I was I was very I'm not a big shutdown guy. I didn't want to shut down for the uh, for the pandemic. I wanted to produce our way out of it in a way um, and guarantee people jobs, but then pay them replacement t pay as they were quarantined because I think that was just a better way. And um, you have to go for meaning first and you have to start it with like people productively working, not just taking care of their quote unquote basic needs, um, but actually like, what are we going to do to get people standing so that they can advocate and meaningfully act in their society for society and for themselves. Um, so like, a federal job guarantee, I think, is like the issue that needs to be uh, first. I also think nobody talked to, and you know, the Vanguard people, I want to hear what you guys have to say, the people who are watching right now. I actually think that um, legal care for all is a sleeper issue for the, for the left. The idea is that we live in a nation of laws, but we, have a, we live in a nation of laws with an asymmetrical access to lawyers. Right. So if you live in a nation of laws, but you have an asymmetrical access to lawyers, you're pretty much you like the law is just the means by which the people who have real access to lawyers like screw you. Right. So if we're going to be we have to democratize access to lawyers if we're serious about living in, an, in, a, in a nation of laws. And in the absence of a, uh, like democratizing access to lawyers, then it's just ridiculous. Peter Thiel, uh, you know, the PayPal billionaire um, was giving an interview where he supported Hulk Hogan. In his the Gawker uh, thing, in the Gawker thing, right? So Hulk Hogan took out Gawker. There's no more Gawker, and it's because of uh, a beef Hulk Hogan had with Peter uh, with uh, with Gawker, and Peter Thiel. And Peter Bankroll, Thiel hated Gawker because they wrote a bunch of blogs about how he was a closet gay guy. Yep, yeah, exactly, right? So, um, in the interview, um, someone asked, "So why did you back?" uh hulk hogan against gawker and he's like well i didn't like gawker as a magazine plus you know what hulk hogan he was just a single digit millionaire and if you're just a single digit millionaire you don't have real access to the legal system anyway so you know i had to give him some money to make sure so this is peter thiel a billionaire telling you that single digit millionaires are functionally chum <laughs> so if Single digit millionaires don't have real legal access. That means Peter Thiel can do pretty much whatever he wants to us, and we're not gonna be able to do anything. Like if, if YouTube or Google or whatever kicks me off, or PayPal kicks me off, and make it, what am I gonna do with them? Peter Thiel pretty much has told me that, like, look, you're not even a single digit millionaire. You really can't do anything to me. Right. Yeah, no, I, I think that's actually a great idea, the kind of universal access to lawyers. It's outrageous that we have such a two-tiered system in that sense. Uh, to go back briefly to the federal jobs guarantee thing, I was going to ask your opinion on universal basic income, but I uh, kind of garnered from your response previously that you would not be in favor of it, given how you were saying that, you know, not only do we need our basic needs met, but we need to, you know, be meaningfully participating in society via a job. 
Um, and my only pushback to that would be, um, what about someone like myself or someone like Zach, who's, you know, found a way to kind of self-employ ourselves through like a podcast? Um, you know, I don't know if a federal jobs guarantee would necessarily cover the kind of job that we do, um, but a, a healthy universal basic income would absolutely support this kind of entrepreneurship you know, online, uh, self-employment, podcasting, et cetera. And to me, I find that, you know, miles more, um, uh, you know, powerful. I find it so much more fulfilling than I would, you know, paving the roads outside or whatever the hell job I would get through a universal job program. So I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Well, the, there's this idea that we can do capitalism without capital. Um, and that's, that worries me because it takes money. Like even my setup here took like, a few grand, right? <laughs> like serious money. So the idea is that we can build entrepreneurship through a federal job guarantee by just paying people $25 an hour to do a job and then they save up money so that they can actually invest in capital to like actually run their business. And we can talk about employee and we can also like have a, a, a system of employee um, uh, payroll subsidies so that you could hire a producer um, because it's you two, right? Like you guys could probably, if you had two more people doing production, things would probably run a lot more smooth, smoother. Yeah, that'd be like, awesome. That'd be awesome. <laughs> two more people doing production. Like it would probably allow you to grow the channel in like a more meaningful way. Right. So a payroll subsidy that would allow you guys to pay them like $4 an hour, but the government to kick in the other $15 an hour and you got uh, 30, 30 hours a week out of them. And it would allow everyone. And then they would get the expertise from working for you guys to do their own thing. And like that would, I think, be a better income system. So I worry about, I worry about the idea that the UBI presumes capitalism doesn't require investment capital. And it's not a serious scheme to um, actually secure people investment capital. Because like, if like to start a business takes money, it takes more. Thirty k is the number I saw like five years ago. It's probably more or less than that right now. But like, if you're serious about starting a business, you need about thirty k. Other than that, it's just a hobby, right? So it's a hobby that may or may not. But if you're actually serious about like making it work, you're gonna need thirty k worth of marketing, uh, design, uh, equipment. You're gonna need about thirty k, right? And you're not gonna save up thirty k on a UBI. So it's not really so it's really a subsidy for people who already have access to family money who's going to give them their 30k and then now they can take their internship do and do whatever they are with that. So like what I like about a federal job guarantee is it gets real money into people. You only have to work it for as long as you need to work it. And then you could quit, you know, spend that 30 you've saved up spent 6 months, saved up 30k or a half year or a year saved up 30k and now you could actually go for it. And then if it doesn't work out, you have another job with real money that, that comes in. And so this whole idea that you can have capitalism and entrepreneurship without like democratizing access to real investment capital is a little bit of worrisome to me, number one. Two, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done that I don't think, like there's a part of the left that thinks that food grows in grocery stores and they're just bad about talking about production. just like. We need things produced and we need to pay people to produce them. That's why we don't have sidewalks when we need sidewalks in neighborhoods. Like we need, that's why like I'm in Athens, Georgia. If I go 15 miles outside of where my place is, anywhere except towards Atlanta, you don't have very good internet. I don't know how things are in Kansas City, but I suspect like past Chillicothe, like they don't have, <laughs> they don't, the internet's not as good as we think it you is. You don't even have cell phone service in Western Kansas a lot of the time. <laughs> like that's just, so like you just don't have cell phone services. No, so like there's work to be done. And so this idea that like we shouldn't just pay people to make, to do this work is, is I think, I think we need to just pay people to do the work and like wellness checks. There are going to be a lot of people, uh, my, my wife's from Kansas city. And, you know, and I've been there a few times. There are going to be a lot of people who are just going to quietly die outside of the area for nobody checking in on them. A lot of baby boomers have just kind of been living in their rural town and like they have their bills on auto pay and nobody's going to check in on them. And, and not to cut you off, but entire towns in Kansas are disappearing because of that exact reason. It's yeah. So like 
And like, we'll, we'll, we'll find out that they're dead a week later, right? Because their kids moved away. They moved to the city or they moved to Lawrence or they moved to California, something like that. And like, you have this town, it's just nobody's seen Bubba in like, you know, a week or so. I hope he's fine. Um, but then like, there's a smell that's going to come. So we're, we find out this guy's been dead for a while. And like, it's because there was no wellness check. So like we could have, we, there's work to be done cleaning these people's gutters, making sure when they slip and fall, they get back up. Like in rural America, we need to think about this aging population that no one's looking in on and they need actual someone to like, like look in on them. And that's like one of the jobs. And I want, since, you know, you, you know, your people want new ideas who are watching this. I think one of the great federal job guarantees could be actually sending out a three person videography team a three-person videography team to every single person on their 65th or 70th birthday to get their side of the story. We have the technology now that we can do it. We send a three-person team to your place. They set up, take your story, come back a week later, get part two, and then upload it to the Library of Congress and to a searchable database. And then every American has a place in the cultural archive like once they get a certain age, they can tell their side. And that way we can get like the side of working in poor America who doesn't have time to like get their memoir ghost written and published, <laughs> right? So um, uh, like, and I think that would be great for our cultural archive so we, we don't get distorted about who we are as a people and so that we can run our democracy better. And that would be a job for, P, for like a three person crew that would do it probably, you don't need, these federal jobs don't need to be 40 hours a week. They can be well paid in 30 to 35 hours a week and that's fine as a productive. Then you get skills with the equipment, you make a good enough money and then afterwards you have the skills and you could run your own thing and you're networked in um, uh, to the community that way. And it would be good for like our democracy. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great idea. I think that's such a creative idea as far as federal jobs guarantee, kind of bringing in some of that New Deal style energy, employing artists, videographers, people with those kind of skills. And just such a creative and, and useful uh, product would be would be produced at the end of the day, too, with, the, like you said, a real archive of, of different generations and their experiences. Um, so I think I love your thinking there, man. Uh, yeah. Just to address a few super chats before we get out of here, we don't want to keep you too much longer. Um, but I did want to get your response to this one real quick. Carolina Boys says, uh, I hate that many leftists are afraid to speak on social justice issues out of fear of being called woke. Stop buying into right-wing culture war framing. So I think this is probably going back to our conversation about feminism and, and identity politics as it related to Bernie's campaign. So if you just have a quick response to this. Yeah, the farther you are to talking about jobs, I think the worse, like actual jobs. So whether, um, like, we need to make sure that working class people get paid good money. And we have to think about what's gonna stop black people, black working class people from getting the job and then getting paid um, well on the job. And it's going to be the wealthy people who run them, but also the white working class people who don't want to have to take orders from them. And so like, we need to just be honest about like the barrier is making sure that everybody has a good job that and, and that like good unionized job in their community and what's going to be the barrier to that. And insofar as the barrier, that's going to be some sort of identity. You just have to bulldoze over that and don't be surprised and don't be, don't run away from it when, you, um, when people get, uh, when people call you woke for saying that like, you know, poor black people deserve good jobs <laughs> and they're not getting them because not just because they're poor, but also because they're black. Right. So like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like, we just got to figure out the barriers to people getting good jobs and fight through them. And what I, some of them are going to be racial. Some of them are going to be gendered and some of them are going to be like um, class-based, but that's going to be the fight. And we just have to fight through all of it. Now, the other side, like what I'm worried about, are the people who just don't care about jobs. Like the people who care about more, more about pronouns than they do about jobs. And like, I'm not anti, like I use all the correct pronouns, but like that's a means to making sure everyone gets the same, the appropriate dignity in their job, <laughs> right? Right, so like, I, I just think people who are casual about what jobs mean are a bigger problem for the left than, um, and they're, they're so casual about what jobs mean, about what production means, 
um, that they just they talk about everything else. And that's that I feel like is a problem for the left. Yeah, not absolutely. Bad identity. Yeah. And then we had one more uh, super chat, too. And thank you for your response on that one. Um, Aiden Aden is asking, uh, he says, Panthers also used to serve the people programs to agitate towards revolution, even short of Reverend Douglas says power concedes nothing without demand. Bill of Rights, abolition, suffrage, civil rights, 40 hour week all had two all had movements to them. Do you have a response to that? Right. I mean, there's some literature that says the Panthers are like used the Breakfast for Children programs and the health programs as a means to get people to what they needed was a political education program. You control their mind, you control their behind. So and so we need them fed so that they can listen to our lecture about, you know, overtaking like the, the predations of capitalism. Right. So that, there's, there's nothing wrong with uh, my background's about to fall down. There's nothing wrong with, uh, I'll just let this go. There's nothing wrong with using the means, uh, using these programs as a means to, uh, you know, propagandize or just kind of educate as, as, a, as a means to get people into the school to educate them. But just don't forget that that's what you're doing. The programs aren't a means, aren't an end to themselves. They're a means to actually get people to fight for the actual secure solutions that they need um, to be empowered in their own community. Yeah, uh, I think that that's a great response. I just had uh, one last thing for you, uh, Irami, and uh, uh, and I think uh, uh, no, I, I I think I actually just forgot what I was going to ask. It was a, I was going to extend on to the the conversation that we were having a little bit earlier because I can't get that Dave Chappelle bit. This it's an old. I know Dave Chappelle. You can't talk about him anymore. But anyway, there's an old Dave yeah. Chappelle bit that kind of summarized uh, exactly uh, what you were talking about. Uh, but we don't have to get into it. I'll just go ahead and say thank you for your time today. And uh, what did, do you have anything uh, up for? Uh, to plug uh you got your yeah. website on there yeah. uh videos uh, tell the people where to find more uh funky academia right so if you like anything i'm saying right now you're not going to get it too many other places so you should go to www.funkyacademic.com and kick in uh you know five fifteen or fifty dollars a month to keep me doing what i'm doing also you can see all of the shows i do on youtube just put in funky academic on youtube um and that will uh bring up my channel it's the one that looks like me and also, we, you know, we need to actually not run away about like what reparations means for black communities. I didn't get to talk about it here, but that's an issue that like people say, well, you know, you'll alienate the, 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 um, the white working class if you talk about reparations. I'm just not sure that even if that's true, it, it might not matter, right? Because if you look at, and I'm going to put some data um, uh, up here, this is 1968 black home ownership. Uh, hasn't really moved from 1968 to 2018. We're a little bit more incarcerated, <laughs> not a little bit, quite a bit more incarcerated as of 2018. And unemployment, now these are pre-pandemic numbers. So, you know, I always just double white un unemployment and that's going to be black un un unemployment. So this idea that anything outside of race specific um, solutions will deal with a problem that was created in a race specific manner might be myopic. Right. So I, you, we need to actually talk about what is it going to do to make black people whole? And then what are the, going to be the barriers to that? And we just need to talk about reparations. We're willing to print money for other people. Like, let's do what we can to actually make black people whole and productive and a productive whole in their communities and outside of it for the nation. Right. So. I would love to have you back on for a conversation specifically about the, the need for reparations and the, the arguments surrounding that. Um, Arami, thank you so much for your time today. It was a pleasure talking with you, and we hope to do it again. Hey, cool. Thanks, 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 thanks. And for anyone who has anything to say about, like, you know, where are these critiques from feminism coming from? There are a few really good books, right? You could read The Mothers of Math Massive Resistance uh, by Elizabeth McRae. You could read The Man Not by Dr. Tommy Curry. It's probably the best single book, um, The Man Not by Dr. Tommy Curry. You can read uh, Louise Newman. Uh, white women's rights, kind of the origin of feminism in the United States, white women's rights. And then there's a new book that came out by um, um, uh, a, a woman, a uh, woman historian uh, on womanhood and segregation. It wasn't Mothers of Massive, it's got, it's got womanhood in the title, but it's a Southern womanhood in segregation. And it, she does a great thing because she does uh, how the elite women kept 
uh, black people down. And also the different story about how working class white women went out of their way to make sure, make sure that they um, uh, leveraged their identity as women to make sure that black people um, stay down. So, you know, I'm one of these guys who actually thinks that anytime there's a real working class movement that that happens, you can't be surprised when a variety of feminism, whatever hyphenated it is, is kind of emer going to emerge out of nowhere to take it out. But because that's because we have fundamentally distorted notions of gender. And it's not just manhood. It's also womanhood that are both anti-labor and anti-black. Well, interesting. Thank you so much for bringing this, you know, fascinating perspective to our show today. Uh, really looking forward to having you on in the future again. If, if you'd be down, we'd love to chat again in the near future. Um, really enjoyed today's conversation. Sorry. Uh, and everyone make sure to chunk it, check out the funkyacademic.com for more. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to want to miss out on his commentary. But yeah, thank you so much, Irami, for joining us today. Good. Thanks. See you guys around. See you, man. Great conversation. Really enjoyed talking to the funky academic, someone who I've been paying attention to for a while. Always enjoy his interviews, always enjoy his commentary. And like I said, unafraid to come at things from a, a you know perspective that sometimes deviates from the from the mainstream thought, which I really appreciate. So yeah, that was an awesome conversation. Uh, did you have anything else to add before we shout out our patrons and get out of here, Zach? Just that everybody should follow him on Twitter. I feel like you're following a philosopher when you're on Twitter. Like you'll get, see a Nirami tweet, and I gotta like scratch my head and sit on it for like ten minutes because it'll be you know like uh, this interesting take. Like this morning, we didn't even get a chance to chat about it, but he had a really interesting take on you know COVID numbers and uh, democracy and how democracy is always boiled down to campaign finance numbers because people don't thoroughly understand it. And I, I was scratching my head and thinking about that. Anyway, he's a great follow on Twitter. We hope to get him back in the hot seat at the Vanguard again. We'll talk about reparations. We'll talk about COVID-19, elections, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, but yeah, ready to sign out the uh, sign off and say goodbye to the patrons. Jesus Christ, none of us can talk, and that's how you know it's time to end the fucking show. <laughs> yeah, usually about 60 minutes in, we start <laughs> scrambling our words and slurring our, our sentences. Uh, but yeah, huge shout out to the patrons. And also, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone that super chatted today. I didn't quite get to you know thank you enough, but really do appreciate that. Aiden, ALW, really appreciate that donation. And everyone else that donated as well, it really means a lot. Thank you so much for contributing to the conversation. But yeah, you guys know the drill. We do like to shout out our patrons at the beginning and the end of every live stream. Um, you guys really do make the show possible. Keep us going. Um, and that link is in the description. If you would like to join the Patreon community, if you'd like a, a, sp a space on the shout out screen at the beginning and end of all of our episodes, that's how you can do it. You can find out about our other benefits too, like our Discord server and our upcoming patron only um, monthly hangout. So we're super excited for that stuff. And you guys should check out that link if you're interested in supporting the show, if you enjoy the content we create. Uh, even just a few bucks a month really truly does help and uh i see the jack just super chatted uh maybe we'll get to that next time uh but appreciate the donation jack so uh thanks everyone for tuning in today um everyone enjoy the rest of your tuesday yeah, yeah and i've read the uh, stephanie kelton book or whatever her name is on mmt and two thumbs up yeah yeah no that's a great book definitely check it out what's it called the the deficit myth the deficit myth. Yeah, yeah yeah absolutely so thank you jack um yeah anyway everyone have a great rest of your day